Thank you, Ola. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, thank you, everybody, for sticking around and staying mostly awake. Um, those are very, very strong complimentary words, so, so thank you. Um, as Olaf mentioned, I did start in consulting, and what he asked me to talk about today is how protocol review works in community practice, uh, but then also to try to relate to you how things work at MD Anderson, where I've been for about four and a half years now, uh, and try to, try to uh, draw some similarities. So this, I don't think I have a laser. Do I have a laser? Laser does not work. Okay, so you see Rochester up there, that little red dot. That is in New York State. You can see that here. And that is a Finger Lakes region. It is spectacular. If you've never been there, you've never heard of it, uh, you know, start thinking about it. Uh, don't go in the winter time. Uh, in the October time frame, you might get about, uh, you have about a two week window to see the leaves unless it rains and then, and then they're all gone. Uh, but it is a beautiful place to drive around. Um, uh, the home office is, uh, is just a little southeast of Rochester and there's another office in Buffalo. And we covered essentially uh, during my years from Erie, Pennsylvania, all the way out to, to Rhode Island and a, and a fair bit of work in, uh, in Connecticut. Uh, so this is a nice view of Canandaigua Lake. I just pilfered the picture from Wikipedia, but I did cite it fairly. So, uh, but it is, it truly is. And so, so, you know, that's a vineyard there and, you know, the lighting isn't outstanding uh, to see the picture really well, but it's, it's a spectacular part of the country. Underrated. So a quick trip back in time. We've heard a lot about this from several of the people. I won't belabor the point, but we do uh, remember the toddler at Mad River. Uh, and then in Cedar sinai in 2009, we had the, uh, the stroke patients who, uh, those who survived uh, their stroke ordeal, uh, ended up with, with burns. Um, and so this is the end of, of 2009, and the FDA announced a, a notification. And, and what they said is, they, they encouraged every facility performing CT imaging to review its CT protocols and be aware of the dose indices. And for each protocol selected before scanning the patients, monitor the dose indices and make sure the values displayed reasonably correspond to what's normally associated. Now, so, so we've heard a lot about today how, of course, we're collecting data or we're starting to or we're gonna. But back then, we, we, we didn't. Okay? So try to put yourself back in 2009 like this just wasn't really commonplace. Every CT imaging facility review all of your protocols? Come on, that just wasn't heard of at that time. People, you know, institutions had like, you know, six different head protocols for the six different ER docs that worked on different nights, that sort of thing. So, okay, how do we do this? And so actually in February of, of uh, 2010, so a few months later, we had a very well-known CT physicist from a very prestigious institution visit us in our, uh, for two days and gave us about 15 hours or 12 hours or something of CE. So we, have, we started the first uh, private practice imaging residency program. And so we had the infrastructure in place to apply and get, and get uh, uh, continuing education credits. Uh, and he came in and, and gave us a lot of great information and education about CT. Didn't fully answer the question, how do you show up and do this? Uh, and so we still sort of had to figure that out, but in April, so when these things start, start moving at the end of 2009, the AAPM decided it would be a good idea to get together for a day and a half and just talk about CT protocols and scan, oper uh, uh, scan optimization and sort of see where people are at. So Bob Pizzatello spoke at that meeting, uh, MD Anderson at representation, Mayo Clinic, physicians from Duke. Uh, so, so I mean, it was, it was a broad representation of uh, uh, the UC system was represented on, on the uh, speaking faculty. So it was, a good, it was a good day and a half. They ended up doing another one, I think, two years later. In attendance of that meeting was a physician who I now call a friend proudly, wonderful woman named uh, Jen Siegelman. Jen Siegelman worked for uh, a private radiology practice that was based primarily at Bacchus Hospital in Norwich, Connecticut. So you can see sort of where we are. So it's about six or seven hours drive for us. Uh, not a bad drive until you get into Connecticut and then it's brutal. Those people drive like crazy. Okay. Uh, so uh, William Backus Hospital had, they had, so QMP is an acronym you may or may not be familiar with. It's Qualified Medical Physicist. So there are actual um, definitions now. Joint Commission has uh, definitions and that uh, came from the AAPM. The AAPM several years ago came up with a with a definition for a qualified, it's really clinically qualified medical physicist. Plenty of medical physicists are qualified individuals who do research and win lots of awards, but 
this is, so this is uh, in a clinical context. So they had actually two of them. One, a gentleman who did just their CT work, and another one who did you know, all, the other, all the other work. Neither of them were Bacchus employees. In other words, they were contractors. And the physicist who did the CT was otherwise full-time employed. So in other words, he would do the CT work evenings and weekends, which is not uncommon. It's not to be disparaged because it's a community hospital that needs this work done. However, when they want a more involved project and they want somebody to be visiting during the day, he's just not available. And so, and so this, this uh, colleague actually referred Dr. Siegelman to, uh, uh, I forget how it went, but one way or another, either, either directly or through another person, uh, he, she ended up with, uh, with Bob Pizzatello's name and our, our, the number to our, our practice. So in the fall of that year, uh, back is called with interest in protocol review. Now I should tell you, at this point, I was sort of tired of hearing the words protocol review because we had actually tried to do this a couple of times with basically no success. Not for lack of effort, I promise you. And we weren't charging an arm or leg because we didn't know how it was going to go. So I can tell you two university institutions asked for help. One of them was, was, was difficult enough and it wasn't a regular client. We actually uh, subcontracted two colleagues out of Florida to join us for a couple of days to go get, get some baseline surveys done and then meet with the Department of Radiology. Now, mind you, this, the chair of, of radiology at this university sought us out to come do this. But, but the person wasn't at the meeting at the end of the second day. So, so where's, where's the interest and where's the leadership? And that, that's a theme that I want you to remember. That's really, really important. So essentially, we went there, we did all the baseline surveys, we met for like two hours around you know, a whole bunch of people uh, uh, and talked about things and some things that we were going to write up and, and what the next steps were going to be. And then we get all the reports out for the physics surveys, and then it's radio silence, it's crickets. I can barely get a response out of the chief tech, let alone a radiologist that supposedly had been tasked with doing the work. So after three months of begging, like here are some of the things I'd like to try, Finally, a radiologist responds, and he's been CC'd on all the emails. Finally, they respond and say, okay, what is it you want me to do? Well, you know, we've already lost. Okay, that, that's, that, it's essentially dead at that point. So the, the other one, <laughs> the other one is also a large, a large institution, and they called and, and they had some questions because uh, they were confused about some of the dose indices that they were seeing uh, after uh, neck CTs, and the, it was basically an issue of well, did the protocol start in the shoulders or the head? So when you do the C-spine, is, is you, are you getting the CTDI reported in the 32 centimeter fan or the 16? And that was confusing them because they were trying to put effective dose values into their literature. Uh, so I found this out later on. And, you know, tisk tisk, we should not be doing that. But uh, so basically, I, I, I wanted to take a step back and say, OK, well, let's, let's make sure we all understand what CTDI is. And so I sent like a five page article from Radio Graphics that talked about CTDI or something like that and said, okay, I'll, call, I'll follow up in a couple of weeks, I'll be on site in a, in a month, can we arrange like an hour meeting so I can understand what you, you know, the scope of what you really want? Well, I, you know, I followed up over and over and it was you know, <laughs> crickets, there was no interest. So not for lack of effort, we had tried with little success and I was getting a little tired of hearing about protocol review when nobody really wanted to do it despite uh, the lip service. So we did actually talk to Bacchus, uh, Dr. Siegelman and uh, their administrator, radiology administrator at the time, talk about the scope of the project and negotiated payment structure. And you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I, I don't want to belittle that point because it's complicated, it's difficult, it's going to be different for every practice, it's going to be different whether you have an employed medical physicist or not. Or I, so, so I don't want to, I'm not going to talk about that, but, but it's, not, it's not something simple. Okay? You have to figure out, you, I mean, if, if it's a physics consulting group, you can't do work for free, that's not how the world works. Um, so you know, that's just one thing to think about. So this was Dr. Siegelman's vision, and this is in the paper that we ended up publishing in JACR about this project. Uh, so we're gonna prepare, we're gonna get together, we're gonna pilot a protocol. Once we like it, we're gonna implement it, and then we're gonna uh, disseminate it throughout the uh, rest of the scanners, and then we'll measure and evaluate our uh, progress. So in this case, what we believed, the four key players are the department administrator, the radiologist, lead tech, and a medical physicist. And everybody has responsibilities going through this process. So the radiologist needs to be champion. 
So I already told you about our failed attempts to do, you know, quote unquote protocol review. Uh, there was no radiologist leadership. There wasn't enthusiasm. So, so that's their first, that's their first, first job. So they have to, they have to own it. They probably want to review some literature. Now there's a lot more literature, you know, compared to, uh, compared to 2010 uh, on this, this subject. A variety of entities ha have been publishing. Um, collect some studies for discussion, some things that they didn't like, things that they did like, and then we can, we can analyze the differences. And you need to start selling it to the other radiologists. You need to sort of, you don't have to beg them to come to all the meetings, but you know, make them aware that you're going to try to do this project and you're going to want their feedback. Do the studies look good? Do they look bad? That sort of thing. Get them, get them to at least be interested. Like, hey, I can get some benefit, but I don't really have to do any work. That should be attractive. So, um, <laughs> So they got, but they got it, you know, there has to be communication there. The administrative person, uh, whether you call it director or administrator, whatever it is, the, the person who's, who's managing the department, who controls the resources, needs to, needs to allocate them. So, and this, this comes in a few different forms. You need to approve some flexible scheduling because uh, your uh, lead tech and other technologists who end up being, you know, called in, who are interested and want to participate, they're, they're going to need to do some, some things, you know, over time or whatever. So you're going to need to approve, approve that and perhaps negotiate for outside support. So that may come in a couple different forms. If you have a physicist who is employed by an institution and that person does not, so just like any other profession, so physicists have different skill sets. Some would be good at this and would like to do this and some perhaps would not. So you know, some internal discussion has to happen and then you can either contract an additional physicist to come in to help with protocol support if, if the in, uh, employed physicist is, is stretched very thin, or you, that you know, employed physicist could, could free up some of their time by contracting out some of the things that take a lot of time, like testing 300 x-ray tubes at Toledo's you know, medical center's health system. So, and then, then that individual is then freed up to help take on some of these um, non, you know, this isn't, this isn't measuring, you know, radiation output, uh, you know, that's part of it, but this is a different, a different type of project, and it, it does take some time. So the CT technologist needs to catalog protocols. Luckily, there are some automated or semi-automated solutions available now because we did that manually, and that can take some time. Uh, I need to make sure that the dose reports are getting to PACS, even at MD Anderson now, sometimes that doesn't happen. We're not always sure why. Uh, need to refresh on the function of your AEC system. Sometimes it involves the vendor. Maybe the physicist can provide a little bit of education, but you want to know how that works. So Bacchus had a uh, Philips Brilliant 64. They had a GE Lightspeed 16. They had a Siemens Definition uh, uh, 40, uh, 20 row detector with the flying focus spot. And, they, and their other uh, offsite was a uh, uh, GE Four Slice, one of the old Four Slices. So that's a pretty good, pretty good smattering of, of, uh, of CT systems. So you want to know how how each of those things works. And then we ask them to go to Image Gently and Image Wisely to just sort of get familiar with, with you know, some of the things that we're thinking about and um, you know, just sort of refresh on the language and so they're you know, sort of uh, prepared for the types of conversations we're gonna have. The physicist uh, is probably going to, so be, you know, Bacchus was not a regular client and so we didn't have any baseline data uh, we didn't know anything about their, you know, the protocols they were using. And so it's a good idea to just show up, get your hands on the systems, push the buttons, make sure they work, see the types of protocols they pull up. When you go to the head, you know, the head you know, section, protocol section, how many of them are there? You know, are they named the same? Do they have like five different doctor names? That's, so just to get an idea of how the system is operating, uh, system meaning the, the hospital, uh, radiology department, uh, take a look at what they're using currently, observe the clinical operation, which if, if you're not employed at a hospital as, as a medical physicist, that you, you, you learn a lot from just spending some time uh, in, in the CT or radiology department. So that's, I don't want to diminish the value of that. That's very, very valuable. Uh, and then you want to, you know, when you spend time there, if you start making some friends, you, people will, will you know, start confiding in you and they'll complain. And you want to take note, note of those things um, because there may be some, some solutions in how, how, you, uh, how you approach scan, uh, scan protocols. So then we all get together, and that's a really important thing. And when we all show up, uh, my opinion is it's important for the administrative person, the manager, director, to be present and be engaged. It's important for everybody around the table to know that they are empowered to do their job. Okay? The success of the project hinges on each person bringing their expertise to the table and sharing it. 
without fear, right? Without fear of retribution. So, so the radiologists, I, I already said this, they need to be enthusiastic and they need to lead this discussion. This is my opinion. You know, your mileage may vary. I, I don't think it works unless the physician is taking the lead. So my experience is that the technologists, and this is in both community practice and at MD Anderson, they're sort of the sanity check. So you know, physicists may want to do things, phys physicians may want to do things, but the people who are actually putting their hands on the patients and providing the direct patient care, in this case, are, are the technologists, and that's, that's really important. And of course, once things are made, changes are made, uh, they're responsible for executing it, and actually a lot of times, you know, the, the uh, minute by minute, hour by hour communication to their colleagues uh, handling patients. And hopefully the medical physicists provide some technical ex expertise, that's, that's what we're supposed to do, uh, and some process improvement uh, hopefully should be offered during, during the discussions. We chose like the easiest, what's the easiest protocol to fix? So that's what we did. So we already talked about AEC and I, and I defended its use for, you know, depending on the preference of a, of a physician. So my opinion is, you know, I, as a physicist, my job is to support them. Like, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, our wagon is hitched as physicists to the radiologist. So um, our job is to help them. Uh, and, and really, they, they only use AEC on their, on their Lightspeed 16, but not for the others. So we were comfortable with the others, the 16, the, the Lightspeed 16, they wanted to use AEC, and so, and so we did that. They were using axial two-second scans, the old default GE protocol, just... Uh, and I already mentioned three, three manufacturers. And they, they, the two-second protocol, you know, the two-second <laughs> rotation time, but, you know, they were, you know, it, they had advanced in the 21st century in that they were using the, you know, the coronal views, sagittal views. The problem is, like, two-second rotation, and then, like, you know, a patient blinks or moves their head, and they move it back, and then you end up, when you do the coronal, it's like, you know, a, a centimeter slab has moved here, uh, you know, in the, in the coronal recon. So, um, that's a pretty, you know, when you're a physicist and you look at that and you, you, you understand the problems that they're, that they're um, having, that, that's definitely low-hanging fruit. So we came up with a new protocol strategy. So I looked, at, I looked at all the problems they're having and said, why don't we try a helical head? So a lot of people, especially at that time, didn't like helical heads for some reasons. Uh, I felt like it could be a good solution for this practice. And uh, Dr. Sigmund said, sure, let's try it. Write it up and put it in the scanner and let's go. And so, so we did that. We just picked... One CT, so we're just going to start on the Lightspeed 16. It's simple, people are comfortable with it, uh, and, so, and so that's, you know, taking baby steps, start small. So that's what we did. Ran a couple, two, three test, test cases, all of us together. So radiologists, physicists, technologists, like seriously, all standing shoulder to shoulder. The clinical workstation is there. We're looking at cases that, that uh, were good and that were bad historically, and then we have uh, timely availability of patients, and so, you know, two, three patients in a row, uh, head scans that are being funneled directly to the scanner, and all of us are working together to see what we think might work. And so once we've decided on it, we implement it, and then we decide what we're going to measure. Now really, ahead of time, we've decided. We're going to take a look at CTDI because, as you'll see, they had a little bit of a, of a CTDI problem on their GE Lightspeed 16. If you just fix the technique, you wouldn't have the problem, right? But, um, but that wasn't, wasn't what they wanted to do, and that's fair. And we wanted to look at the recall rate and radiologist satisfaction. So radiologist satisfaction, we didn't really measure. Um, that was more of a qualitative assessment. And then, you know, a couple of little details, uh, recon thickness and, and such and overlap and stuff, we sort of tweaked those um, iteratively as we, as we went along. So then, you know, comes a little bit of a challenge and that's where experience uh, as a physicist is very valuable to take what I, you know, what we're putting into the GE Lightspeed 16 and be able to translate it relatively easily into a Siemens uh, definition 40 system, or, you know, we had to do a different, whole, whole different protocol for the GE4 slice, um, and then again into the, into the Phillips. So the Siemens system can tilt the gantry for a helical scan. So we did that, and that avoids having to tilt the, the patient's head to try to avoid scanning the lens of the eye. So, you know, little things like that, um, or compensate so the 4 slice system was just not quite as, quite as good, so we had to, we had to change uh, and again, you, you iteratively adjust your protocols as you go. Measure and evaluate. So quality and safety, we compared to some published data. The published data at that time was basically the, the ACR accreditation program. 
And when we actually had some real measured success, we were able to talk to people about it. And you know, physicians were excited. They didn't have to do too much work. The technologists were excited. They didn't have to do too much work. But they knew they were being watched. They felt like they were part of a team. And the team had succeeded. So that was, that was a good thing. And you know, we believe, I believe, that if you do something like this, you should try to at least get an abstract out of it. So that's, that's good experience, good recognition for the good work that people are doing. And it advances us, right? It advances this discussion. And so we did. We published this. So this is a paper. It ended up being uh, published in 2013. And so, the, the, so the, the quantitative analysis is we took the repeat rate on that light speed 16, 100 patients first, and then the, the uh, intervention happened, and then 100 patients after the intervention. Repeat rate went from 13% to 0%. That's pretty good. I like the 0%. And again, using AEC on that system, the number of cases that were below the ACR's reference level for head scans, uh, the reference level 75 milligray, went from 38% to 51%. So that's an improvement. And then the pass-fail criteria is 80 milligray. We went from 58% to 75%. So clearly the intervention was good. It helped. And obviously there was a little bit more work to do. So another important piece of this project, and this was part of Dr. Siegelman's vision at the time, was to estimate the cost of such a project. And this is a little bit staggering. So when we, when we tallied up the hours, we counted the emails that we had sent. The radiologist spent 10 hours uh, on the project. Another eight, that's for analysis. So that's not really uh, accounted for in the dollars that you'll see in a slide or two. Uh, the physicist, I spent 18 hours on it. That does not count, like that doesn't double count. So if residents were with me, I didn't, I didn't double count that. So that's just only time that I spent doing emails and, and analysis and that sort of thing. Uh, Technologists spent 20 hours plus eight on analysis and the administrators spent five and we had uh, a clerical person work, you know, taking minutes and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, this really did span everybody. Uh, everybody had to get involved. So using available wage data at the time, so we would have been writing this, uh, we put this together for an abstract at 2011 RSNA. So these would have been, the published data in 2011 would have been for 2009 and 2010. Uh, I left the cursor on, on this so you can see you know, what we did. So just add up the total hourly wages, and then we added the cost of the four physics surveys. So if you don't need to do the physics surveys, you can knock seven grand off of that. So that's, that's pu published data. That's not what what our quote or our, uh, our financial agreement was between entities, but that's what it would cost given the time that we spent uh, in the available wage data. So if you say, I want to do this for 30 protocols per, per, say you have four CT systems and 30 protocols per CT unit, which is adorable, right? Who's got 30 protocols? I mean, that turns out to be 165 grand to go through one round of that. Now I, you know, maybe, and, you know, maybe the, the analysis is flawed, but I mean, that's a, that's a pretty straightforward way to try to figure out how this is, uh, how much that's going to cost. But there are some caveats. So the head, of course, is pretty simple. So when you start looking at your chest, abdomen, pelvis, and you know, how are you splitting up those series and stuff like that, you know, maybe, maybe that's a little bit more complicated and, and, uh, and maybe takes more time. But the more you meet, the more you do it, the more you work together, you're going to get more efficient. You're not going to have to meet as much and, and so forth. And of course, you know, we know that software developments have, have uh, played a big role in the last several years, and those things were really just starting to take hold. Um, you know, what's now, what, what Radometrics was, was really just starting to get going at that time. And of course, there are several more players now in the market. Um, you know, and so the initial sort of getting together, you know, that, that, that will basically go away as you proceed into more protocols. Uh, so that experience more or less uh, led to, par partly, led to uh, a medical physics practice guideline. So who knows what a medical physics practice guideline is? Some of you. Okay. So historically, the AAPM would publish uh, task group reports, but they came out of what is science council. So the AAPM has an education council, professional council, uh, science council. So science council would put out these huge scientific reports and you, regulatory agencies or accreditation bodies would be tempted to adopt those as some sort of standard or requirement, but these are scientific documents. These are not intended to be mandatory. These are sort of you know, larger exploratory type documents. So the AAPM has an initiative, Medical Physics Practice Guidelines, which are intended to be sort of a baseline uh, minimum standard of practice. 
And the first one in imaging was on CT protocol review. You can see a couple of names you might recognize. Uh, that's me. Uh, that's Bob. He's sitting in the audience. Um, so Mike McNick Gray is at UCLA. Rick Lehman was at Ohio State. He actually just joined MB Anderson last week. Uh, Tyler's out in California for a consulting group. And Diana Cody is one of my supervisors uh, now at MD Anderson. Now, if you read this, you'll, you'll, you'll notice when you read about the responsibilities of, a, of the qualified medical physicist, you'll notice that it sounds a lot about the stuff that I've just been telling you. And uh, so meeting with the team, clinical observation, maybe phantom measurements, side-by-side -side image review with the radiologist, discussion of equipment performance and stuff. So, you know, I, I had a heavy hand in drafting this, and, and people seemed, seemed to think it was okay. Uh, so this is what we ended up with. So if you look at the bottom paragraph, while the reg regular dialogue is important, the QMP should also remember that facility personnel themselves, in particular the lead radiologist, should lead the protocol management and review process. The QMP is an integral member of the team. So, and, and again, if you don't really have an experience on the system, you know, on the CT unit, you probably want to get in there, just get your hands on the system, push the buttons, and, uh, and get a handle on what they're doing. So that side-by-side -side image review with radiologists, I think that's really important. So moving forward, we're probably going to try to get away from describing medical physicists as, ed as either in-house or consulting. Um, you can be employed by a healthcare system and be spread really, really thin, and almost all of your work is, is testing x-ray tubes. You can also be uh, a consulting physicist and do that. You can be a consulting physicist and do fun projects like this that I had the opportunity to do, uh, and you can also be an in-house physicist and do, do projects like this. So, so really, the delineation is not, does not really hold anymore. You know, um, Healthcare systems are, are, are you know, consolidating and they're bringing some of that, that work in-house again. So, so but, but at the time when we wrote this, this is, you know, this, is, this is what it looked like. So my point here is that ongoing protocol review project may consume a lot of the physicist's time. You need to adequately communicate with the supervisors um, that this is the case and understand that this is an ongoing investment in quality of patient care. And for the consulting physicist, they are above and beyond normal consulting services. So you need to make this clear with your clients and negotiate the services appropriately. So this is just an example of some of the fallout. This is in Texas. So a few years ago, Texas said you need to come up with a radiation protocol committee, RPC, for CT and fluoroscopically guided interventional procedures, but we're not gonna talk about that. So the summary is basically, you need to have a protocol committee you need to track radiation output for CT studies. You need to come up with some reference levels. You need to have actions for follow-up. And you need to review all your protocols annually. And you need to keep your records for five years. So that's what Texas says we have to do. And so to meet this minimum requirement at maybe Anderson, what we've done is basically we had a patient dose committee already. It included the RSO, which is great because Texas requires the RSO to be part of this. Nobody else requires that, but Texas requires that. So, so the existing patient dose committee, um, there it is, the RSO, uh, is, uh, is handling this sort of baseline safety type stuff. So reviewing the protocols, this is just a, a screen cap of a homegrown software program. I know you're all going to roll your eyes, but a homegrown software program that, that um, allows us to uh, look at our CT protocols. It's, it's not the whole thing. It actually, um, we can see across all of our scanners if any, any parameters have been changed. Uh, we get automatic email notifications every morning if anything has changed on any protocols. Uh, it identifies which systems have any variable, uh, any parameters that are different from the master protocol. Um, so anyway, the, the point here is these little you know, circles here. So this, the, the orange uh, circle with the question mark, that means it's, it's due soon for review. The green uh, with circle with the white check mark means it's been reviewed recently. So we're meeting this sort of, you know, we're, so we're showing this date. Yes, we hear you, we need to review it. Uh, and here's our documentation that it's been reviewed. Uh, and the patient dose committee historically has handled things like, uh, you know, if, if a patient actually uh, has a dose request, which, you know, we handle those from time to time, or if interventional radiology has a high dose case and there's some analysis and follow up, you know, they review all of that. And so this is um, just a couple of, of events for where our notification values for dose check were exceeded. These are service events. There's no no uh, PHI in there, but when those things happen, we get, you know, those studies hit our protocol server and we get uh, email notifications immediately and then 
we're on the phone with uh, the technologists in the control room. So again, behavior changes when, uh, when they're being watched. So, um, so they know, and I mean, this is almost 100% of the time it's because the patient's big, right? That's, that's pretty standard. Um, uh, behavior's pr pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good. But that's really just addressing the baseline like safety concerns of the regulatory body. So what about quality? We're, we happen to be, um, break our protocols up into anatomical sections. It's not exactly how the Department of Radiology is, 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 is uh, sectioned off, but, but it's close. Uh, and they all meet at some frequency. So I'll talk about body because that's sort of the, they meet the most often and there's the most action in, in the body section. So one of the things that our uh, IT group did for us uh, is they built a tool where you can right click on an image in PAX and you can see my mouse is hovering over there, it's impossible to see. But those bottom two options are uh, report image quality issue and report PAX change request. So if a study is out of place or a series should be deleted or whatever, you make a PAX change request. If there's an artifact, if there's a dose concern, if there's missing anatomy, any of these things, they go to image quality issue, they report it, click on it, and when they click on that, it takes them here, they can click on their concern. We tried to create um, you know, the 10 or so most common concerns. Uh, and the patient demographics will all auto-populate, the physician's information will auto-populate, and then when they click submit, it's automatically distributed to all of CT physics support. It goes to the C CT supervisors and to the two CT protocol uh, abdominal uh, imaging man uh, uh, co-chairs, the committee co-chairs. So all of us <laughs> get, get paged if there's an issue. And so, you know, you know paging, beeping, beeping, and, and buzzing. And, uh, and then so we have, to, we have to triage those issues. So this, this may seem like a pie in the sky thing, but I, I, don't, I don't really think that it is. So somebody made the point earlier that IT is a huge, huge uh, component of successful radiology operation. I just don't believe that, that programming something like this is, is pie in the sky. I believe that there are people out there. I believe that if you wanted this tool, you could get um, uh, a summer student, a college student with coding experience to do this. Uh, there are medical physics graduate students. Uh, you know, there are just con you know, coding contractors for hire. I, I just, I don't, I don't believe that options are, are so limited that other institutions couldn't get this done if they wanted to. So the radiologists lead for us. I've made this point already. Um, in general, when an issue comes in, you know, we'll look at it. And if it's something like, you know, the injection rate is too slow, the contrast is no good, you know, that, I, I, don't, I don't need to respond to that. But if I'm on coverage and it's something else, it's an artifact, then, then you know, I need to respond to that. So depending on the issue, uh, somebody will respond between CT supervisors and uh, physics support. And during the course of, of a month between meetings, uh, the radiologist, the two, two chairs, will collect cases, MRNs and accession numbers, for review. And a lot of times these are um, you know, really interesting, and sometimes it's because the radiologist accidentally was, was trying to interpret the QC series off of a dual energy study and they're not supposed to do that. So, you know, a, lo a lot of the times it's, it's really worthwhile and sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's something that, that doesn't need to be discussed for very long. But we see, on average, you know, six to 12, half dozen to a dozen cases uh, per month will we'll take some time to look at. So in our protocol management software, this is essentially like the header of one of our protocols We've started keeping track of all of our versions the past couple of years when we make a s substantial change, something worth recording, because again, the state of Texas says we have to keep records for five, five years. So, so this is us meeting, meeting requirements. Um, and I think there's value here to see where we've, where we've been, because you know, we're, we're, we, we circle back to things. So this is a, a pretty big patient. So this is a 50 cm uh, field of view. So that's a pretty big patient. So, I'm pretty sure that sometime in my four and a half years there, we, we were scanning really big patients with 140 kV because of street guard effect. We don't have that documented uh, that, I, that I can see, and maybe I'm wrong, but we're now going back to 140 kV to try to limit some of the streaking. And we tried to up the injection rate a little bit to, to try to compensate. And so these two images side by, they're not the same patient, not exactly the same, I realize that, um, but just a little bit of a demonstration difference, you know, the image quality here is a little better. So, so if we had a record of this, you know, maybe we could go back and look at studies um, that we had done uh, to, sort, to sort of you know, get an idea. But, but at this point, we've, we've done a handful of cases and we've implemented that in the last uh, month or so. 
So this is another interesting uh, case that happened actually last week. Double check my time. Okay. Where this is a uh, nine-year-old girl, and you can see she has an enormous lesion in her liver. And she's since gone through treatment, and the radiologist emailed and said specifically, this patient is a candidate for either transplant or resection. I need exquisite image quality. Okay, well, this is also a nine-year-old girl. So, you know, so that was, that was on a Wednesday, and I was on coverage on, on Thursday. So go in the morning and go to the CT clinic, and the patient has not yet arrived yet, so I asked to be paged when the patient arrives and went to my meeting and, and got paged a couple hours later and came back. So meanwhile, you know, we had exchanged several emails, the physicists, to decide what we were going to do, and we had come up essentially with a plan. So you can see 2.75 mill, uh, milligray, uh, her diameter, she's essentially circular. She's about 23 and a half cm in diameter. Um, so, you know, that, that gives you an SSDE here. So it's like, I, I forget, the multiplication factor is almost one and a half, so uh, to come up with SSDE in her size. So in, in my head, what, and, and what we agreed on as a physics group was, we need exquisite detail, so uh, we need to see the vasculature for, for surgical planning if necessary. So, um, you know, we, we, we want to uh, target probably about 22 milligray SSDE. So that, that was what we ended up what we ended up coming, you know, the, the conclusion, and, and no pressure to technologists, but the technology, the, the injection timing is going to be critical. Um, so, so that's, that's what we did. And so we, we did the scout scans and then looked at the MA table and, and adjusted from there, got the noise index that, that gave us what we thought was, was right and, and ended up with, with a pr pretty good study. So 14 milligray CTDI and about 23 and a half SSDE. So ordinarily, for a nine-year-old that's, that's not under these circumstances, you, you, I, I don't do that. You don't make that decision. But under the circumstances, this patient may have an opportunity to keep their own liver by having a resection after some chemo treatment. Well, you know, now we have a, a, a different set of circumstances to uh, consider. So those two images side by side. So what I didn't tell you about uh, the medical physics practice guideline was AAPM, uh, there are task group 225. So believe it or not, we've had over 225 task group. We're actually over 275, I think, at this point. Anyway, something I didn't read. It is recommended that the consulting QMP discuss with each facility access to images, including but not limited to remote access, the facilities, PACs. So, I spoke at the AHRA last summer as part of a, a, a panel discussion uh, that Landauer uh, sponsored. And you know, when I described some of the support mechanism at MD Anderson, they, you know, somebody asked, well, how, how can we do that? And there were some applause and you know, to sort of you know, you know, knock me off my high horse. But I don't think this is pie in the sky either. When I was consulting for, for Bacchus Hospital, I had remote access to their PACs. So Dr. Siegelman could send me an MRN, and, or if she knew I was in the office, she'd call my desk, and I'd log into their PACs, and we'd look at the study together. It's, it's not that hard. Of course, it's an interruption, et cetera, et cetera, and we have so many interruptions, all these things. But this, so this, this is manageable, is my point. You can do this even if you're not employed by that institution. So is this all actually necessary? I, we've probably beat this to death. I don't, want to, I don't want to upset Andrea by this terrible uh, summary of what they require. Uh, the ACR says something, uh, and, and you have to do things. And so, yeah, you have to do something. Okay, You're all familiar with those things. You have to do something. Um, and so as decision makers, can you raise your hand if you are a, I, I've, I've callously referred to you as an admin, in the, in, but if you're an administrator or a director of a department or a manager, raise your hand. If you, okay, and keep your hand up. Do you feel like you have a good, um, a good, like strong protocol review process in place at the moment? A couple, a handful, a few. Okay. So you have you have a decision to make, and it's not easy. Okay, and and dollars are part of it. Uh, that's that's just part of your 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 position. 
So I'm going to make a quick allusion to um, what's, what you're probably going to see published, hopefully by the end of the year, if we're lucky. Uh, and that is a document that, from the AAPM that sort of re-describes the practice of imaging medical physics, diagnostic medical physics, and provides a different sort of um, taxonomy. And so you can choose level one. And level one services, I can't get into all the details, but level one services we're going to define, or we have defined as, basically baseline services to stay in business. You can meet requirements. You can meet accreditation requirements in a, in a very, um, thin, can't think of the right word, very thin way. You can, you can get by with a, with a minimal amount of effort and time. And maybe that's appropriate for your institution. That's a decision you have to make. Level two, so level two is something that is not necessarily required, but a medical, in the context of the practice of medical physics, but a medical physics, physicist brings value to doing it, um, and there is guidance available to help guide you. You've got a, a, a practice guideline. Um, the ACR has other guidance in their, in their QC manual. Uh, there is other literature uh, that has been published uh, on this subject. So you can, you can purchase, procure more services to do more fun stuff and get more results, uh, with a project like this. And then level three, as we define it, is basically you're, you're creating your own, you're, you're blazing new ground. You're creating your own, uh, your own stuff. Um, so I'm just about out of time. I just put this in here. I didn't know how much other speakers were going to speak about uh, dose index monitoring. So that acronym I want you to remember because it ought to be in the July issue of the JACMP. That's a journal of Applied Clinical Medical Physics, and it's a, it's a medical physics practice guideline. Olaf alluded to it. It's, uh, the title is Performance Characteristics of Dose Index Monitoring Systems. And so it, it outlines a whole lot of questions that you want to ask uh, and consider when you're trying to implement one of these software programs. It doesn't tell you how to use it. We're not there yet. Hopefully that's the next practice guideline or task group report. But it tells you a lot of questions that you should ask and baseline performance characteristics, what you should expect as output um, from these uh, commercial products. So again, I think that ought to come out in, there was an issue in May, and uh, it was not in there, so it ought to be in the July issue. And that is publicly available. That is not a subscription-based um, publication, okay? So everybody should, should have access to that. Hopefully you find it useful. So, to wrap up, what did we learn? So I put level two and level three in there because it's kind of going a little bit above and beyond just the bare minimum what's required. The commonalities, the radiologist has to lead. I honestly just don't see it any, any other way. It doesn't get done if the radiologist is not championing the effort. And the administrator has to support it. Administrator, manager, director. So whoever, whoever that person is, whoever controls the resources, that person has to be supportive, and they have to empower the people who are actually doing that project, executing the project. Now, I realize that's challenging. You're in a tough position because you do have to sell it upward. Um, and I didn't talk about that at all. I don't know uh, much. You know, that's beyond the scope of my expertise. I can sell it to you, but I can't sell it up. Um, so some of the really important things when you're executing this type of project is it's a roundtable approach and everybody gets to talk, nobody's voice is, is diminished. Um, relationships, I mean, it's just like elementary school, you gotta make friends, you gotta communicate, uh, and honestly, the, the clinical personnel, the, the technologists who are executing these things, um, they need to be adaptable, and in my experience, they're, they're, they're highly adaptable. Um, so this, this little flowchart here uh, still holds, and you really kind of kind of live in this area here. So once you've kind of gotten to know each other, you've done a little prep, um, then this, this cycle kind of goes, goes on, on and on and on. You get more efficient. Maybe you don't have to sit down around a table every month. You know, maybe get together quarterly or annually and you exchange a bunch of emails or, or whatever. Uh, but there needs to be a lot, uh, plenty of communication. So I want to share, this is a picture. I think it's really cool. Something that's just started happening at MD Anderson. This is uh, an operating room. There's a 14-year-old girl on that table who's covered up. That is a Siemens Definition 128 on rails. What you can't see is surgeons. What you can see a little bit of is all the hardware and tools. 
and you can't see all of the anesthesiology stuff over here. So this patient has been, has been uh, opened up. She has a, a rare uh, tumor in her spine. She actually ended up having two vertebrae resected and a whole lot of hardware put in. 14-year-old girl. And so you can barely see a little thing sticking up out of those drapes. That's a navigation system. So we have a high-end, you know, almost state-of-the-art CT system on rails. And we have a, it's a custom carbon fiber surgical table, so it doesn't give you a bunch of streak artifact. Uh, and then a navigation system to assist the surgeons with you know, re reconstructing, putting in the hardware. So this is a great example of um, you know, imaging physics, working with perioperative services, working with you know, surgery, you know, working with CT technologists. So that's one of our CT techs. The other one's in the coat there. It is freezing in the OR. Um, and so that's a great example of, of collaboration. And this isn't going to happen everywhere. I understand that. But I just think it's a really cool example of, of uh, you know, helping things out. So when you talk about you know, a theoretical risk to, to somebody who's, you know, uh, somebody like me who might need an admin CT and it's like 18 milligray, you know, that's, that pales in comparison to, to the risk that this, you know, this patient. So, so I, what I'm saying is there's some sort of, should be some sort of balance in the discussion. And I wanted to present this as a really cool thing that I'm excited about uh, at our institution.